Zygla, usually they don't have a xylem and phloem. So meat is like of the uh, xylem. So xylem means they transport the water and phloem to transport the food. Okay. So this force, uh, this forces most uh, non-vascular to be mosses. And they have to live in the in their uh, nutrient sources. So like this one, the most need water, right? So they have to live in the uh, most uh, place. Okay, so it's easy for them to get water, right? And then another one, okay, so this is another, right, another uh, example. So to show the non-vascular and also the vascular plants, okay? So they live close to the grounds because it's easy for them to assess the nutrients so like such as water, okay, mineral, and they don't have an internal transport system. Okay, and then the first for vascular, okay, usually this uh, very uh, large, uh, large trees, okay, they so got stem like that, okay, and they, have, they got the flower, okay, and to enable, this one is to enable them to uh, transport nutrients, okay, so means they must have a xylem and flower. Okay, so next one is the flowery but uh, plants. So the flowering plants produce flowers which become fruits that contain seed. So each seed has a cotyledon. So the cotyledon, they, cons uh, they got the, the they store of food, okay, that it will be used by the seed to germinate, okay. So a seed has one cotyledon, is called as a monocotyledon. A seed with a pair cotyledon is called, is called as a decotyledon, okay. So, I repeat again. So, this one is plants. Okay. So, divided into two, uh, two part, non-flowering plants and flowering plants. So, under the non-flowering plants, so they got three, okay, three parts, moss, fern and conifer. Okay. So, moss, they are, uh, both, uh, all of it is, uh, sorry, for moss and fern, okay, they are produced by producing a spores. Okay. For, but for moss, they are non-vascular. So mean they don't have stem, okay, they cannot transport food, okay. And then for fern, they are vascular, means they got a xylem and phloem, and usually they got a stem. Okay, for conifer, it's a vascular, so mean they got xylem and phloem to transport the food, but they are produced by berry cones, okay. And then, uh, so, and then another one, this is the differenti uh, differentiation between vascular and nas vascular right and then the next one is the flowering plants so flowering plants usually has a cotyledon so inside the cotyledon they got a food okay so this food uh, will be used when they uh, buy seed to germinate okay to germinate so a seed which has one cotyledon is called a monocotyledon with two, uh, two cotyledon we call it as a decotyledon right and then next one so what's the difference between monocotyledon and decotyledon? So of course monocotyledon only one cotyledon, decotyledon has got two cotyledon. Okay, and then about the root. So usually for monocotyledon they are fibrous root. Okay, and then for decotyledon, okay, so they got a tap root. Okay, and for mo for monocotyledon their leaf is a parallel veins. Okay, for decotyledon it's like network like Beans. Okay, for monocot uh, monocotyledon, so most have a non woody stem. Okay, and decotyledon has a woody stem. Okay, and then for monocotyledon, the example is such a body and mist plants. Okay, for decotyledon, uh, decotyledon, tom uh, tomato plants and durian tree. So this is the what is a parallel veins look like. Okay, and this is a network like veins. Okay, so this is for the leaf, okay. So, and then this is called as a fibrous root and this one is called as a tap root. Okay, so this is actually decotyledon and this one is for monocotyledon. So, you can see the difference between monocotyledon and decotyledon. Oh, this is for the leaf for the monocotyledon. This is the leaf for decotyledon, okay. So, the root is also different, right. So... Alright, the next one, 
Okay, the next one is diagram 7 shows the type of interaction. So what is the type of interaction? This one is actually the snake. Okay, the snake is eating the uh, mouse here. Yeah. Okay, so this is the prey predator okay, interaction. Okay, so we do a little revision, right? So habitat. So habitat is the natural surrounding or home of an organism. So actually where is the organism live? So that is called as a habitat. Alright, and then the second one is species. Okay, a species is a group okay, of organism that had common characteristic and can reproduce to breed of spring. Okay, so and then population. So population is a group of organism okay, of the same species. Okay, that live in the same habitat. Okay, and then for community, a community is a few population okay, of different organisms that live together in one habitat and have mutual interaction with one, one another. So this is the example. Okay, so and then this, then all this, okay, so we call it, this one is a echo. System. So, ecosystem is a few communities that live together in one habitat and have mutual interaction with another, okay, including all the non-living components such as water and soil. Okay. So, this is a species. So, this is the example. So, let's say this is a species, dragonfly. Okay. So, a few species, right, uh, will produce a population. Okay. And then the few population... Okay, we produce the community. Okay, and then a community, a few community, we produce the ecosystem. Okay, so this is the example of the pond ecosystem, right? Okay, so interaction between organism. Okay, so interaction between organism okay, comprises symbiosis, prey predator and competition. So it divide by three. Okay, so there are three types, uh, three types of interaction between organism. The first one is a symbiosis, second one is a prey predator and another one is competition. Okay, okay under the symbiosis, they got three types of interaction. The first one is mutualism. Commensalism and also parasitism. Okay, so this one you have to remember. Okay, so I repeat the first one. They got three types of interaction: symbiosis, prey predator, and competition. So under the symbiosis, they got three types of interaction. So it calls as a mutualism, commensalism, and also parasitism. Okay. Alright, so symbiosis. Okay, so symbiosis happen when two or more organisms, different species, live closely together and interact with each other. So this one, the symbiosis include mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. So the first one, we have we look at the mutualism first. Okay, so mutualism is an interaction that benefits both organisms. So it means it gives a benefit, a benefit for both organisms. Okay, so the this is a few okay example of mutualism. Okay, the first one is CC anemone. Okay, so this is protect the clownfish uh, fish from predators and supplies food. Okay, and then for the clownfish, okay, it cleans the sea anemone and also provide nutrients to sea anemone in form of waste. Okay, so this one the sea anemone protects the clownfish. It give a protection and also it give the Put to the clownfish, right? And then the clownfish, so what the clownfish do? So clownfish cleans the sea anemone and provide nutrients, okay, to the sea anemone in the form of waste. So both of them got, uh, got the benefits. So this is called as a mutualism. Okay, and then the second one is a lichen. So lichen is an algae and fun uh, fungi that live together, okay? So the fungi... Uh, supply water and minerals to the algae, okay, and then the algae carry out photosynthesis and supply food, okay. So means the fungi give water and minerals to the algae, and then the algae give, okay, carry out photosynthesis and give food to the fungi, 
Okay, so this is a mutualism. So both of it got uh, got the uh, benefits. Okay, so lichen got uh, water and mineral. Uh, sorry, lagi uh, asli ya. Okay, lichen. Okay, lichen got water and mineral from the fungi. Okay, and then the fungi get food from the lichen. So both got benefits. Okay, and then the second one is the mina. Okay. So the mina gets food from the buffalo by eating the lice that stick to the body of the buffalo. Okay. And then the body of the buffalo is free of lice. Okay. So this is the which, uh, benefits. Okay. Example of the uh, mutualism. So this the mutualism, they give a benefits for, uh, to both organisms. Right, the next one, okay, under the symbiosis, another one is a commensalism. So, commensalism, so the interaction between two organisms which only benefit one organism without harming. Okay, without harming or benefiting the other. Okay. So, example here is a ram, uh, ramora fish. Okay, so the ramora fish latches on the sharks, okay, host and get its fruit from scrap and scattered by its host okay so when the shark eat okay eat another fish so then we have a, a scraps okay scattered by the shark so the remora fish okay eat the uh scrap okay scrap scattered by the shark here okay so the remora fish gets the benefit but the shark didn't get anything okay so this is a common sir. And then another example is the bird's nest fern. Okay, grows in the branches of tree to get the sunlight. So the bird nest fern is a common cell. So it grows between the branches of trees to get the sunlight. Okay, but the, so the tree does not harm. Okay, uh, it does not harm the tree. Okay, but it got a benefit by get the sunlight. So this is an example of the common cellism. Okay, the one that got benefit without harming another. Okay, and then the next one is the parasitism. Okay, so parasitism. Alright, so the parasitism is the interaction between one organism only and harms the other. Okay, so the parasite is the organism that benefits. Okay, host is the organism that is harmed. So this is actually the tapeworm. Okay, so this one is actually inside the human intestine. Okay, so the tapeworm, okay, they got the nutrients, okay, the food, okay, from the human intestine, right? So we are the host, so we are the one that is, that being harmed by the tapeworm, okay? So this is the parasitism. Okay, and then the second one is the lice, okay? So the lice suck the bloods of human and animal hosts. Okay, so <coughs> lice is a parasite, okay, and it's uh, suck blood, for, uh, blood from the humans and animals, so we are the host. So, alright, okay, so uh, I repeat again, alright, okay. okay, so we already learned, okay, there are three types of, this, okay, uh, three type of direction, symbiosis, pre-predator, Competition. Okay, so what we already learned, symbiosis, under the symbiosis, you got the mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. So mutualism, both of the organ uh, species got the uh, benefit from each other. Commensalism, only uh, one organism that get the benefit, but this, it does not harm okay, another uh, organism. But parasitism, Okay, only one uh, organism that get benefit, but it harm the another uh, organism, right? <laughs> so next we see for the pre-predator and competition, okay? So pre-predator, so they involve one organism that eats another organism. Okay, so prey is the organism that is eaten by the predator, okay? And then the predator is the organism that hunts another organism for Food. Okay, so this is the example okay, of the predator and prey uh, interaction. Okay, example of the animals. Okay, and then next one is the 
Competition. So, competition happen when the organism in one habitat compete for limited supply of basic needs, okay? Such as uh, light, okay, space, wat uh, water, food and mix. Okay, so this is the zebra. You can see this one. They are same species but they are compete uh, to for the mate to reproduce. Okay, this one is another species. Okay, different species. Okay, one is a cheetah, one is a uh, lion. Okay. I, I think a lion. Okay, and then they compete, okay, to get the food. Okay, different, uh, different species. Okay, so this is called as a competition. Okay. Alright, so we move on to the next question. Okay, so the air pressure in an enclosed container increases when the container is heated, right? So which of the following explanation is correct? Okay, so the answer is C. Okay. Wait, wait, no, this one the answer is B, not C. Okay. The air pressure in the enclosed container increases when the container is heated. So when the container is heated, right, so the energy, uh, the kinetic energy, okay, uh, the kinetic energy for the air molecule is increased. So it means it moves faster. Okay. So it moves faster, it will collide more to the uh, wall of the container and also the collision between the particle will be increased since that it moves in the uh, higher speed. Okay, so the answer should be B. Okay. Alright, so next one, the explanation. Okay, so this is the kinetic theory of gas. Okay, so the kinetic theory of gas state the air molecule, alright, always move about freely and collide with the wall of its container. So this is the air molecule. So it will always move. Okay. It will always move. Okay. So let's say I take this uh, example, the molecule. So it will move. Okay. Randomly. Right. So when you move randomly, it will collide with its, uh, with other molecule, uh, with other molecule also. Okay. And it also will collide with the wall of the container. So okay? This is the container. It will also collide with the container and also will, will collide with another molecule. So if uh, the frequency of collision between the air molecule and the walls of the container, we produce a force, okay, that pushes against the wall, okay. So when it collide with the container, they will produce a force to the container, okay. So this force is called as a air pressure, okay. So when it's moving and it collides with the air container, so when it collides with the air container, it will produce a force to the air container. Okay, so the then the force is called as a air pressure. Alright, so the factors that affect air pressure. This one is a volume. Okay. So let's compare okay these two containers. Okay. So the first one you can see the container is bigger than this one. So the molecule here, okay, they still collide with each other, okay, but not uh, so much, okay, not as high as this one. Okay, for this one, because the space is small, right, so the frequency of the collision, okay, the frequency of the collision between the molecule and also the wall container is higher, right, because there is not enough space to move. So then we collide more with the wall container. Okay, so means the force here, okay, the force that be given to the container is much bigger here compared to this one. Okay, so when a closed container is compressed, the volume in the container is reduced. Okay, so we compress it so until it becomes like this. So this causes the air particles to collide more frequently with the walls of the container and the air pressure in the container increase. Okay. So, because there's no space here to move, so the air molecule to move, it will collide more to the wall container here. So, it means the collision will produce higher pressure. Okay. And then the next one is the temperature. Okay. So, let's say if you heat the container here. Okay. You, give, uh, you heat the container here. So, it will move faster. The air particle will move faster. So when it move faster, what will happen? It will mean uh, the collision between the 
molecule and the wall container also will become greater. Okay, because the they can move, okay, they can move with high velocity here. Oops. Okay. So it will collide more with the wall container, right? So when the air temperature in the closed container increase, the air particle move faster. Okay. So this causes the air particle to collide with the walls of the container more frequently with a greater force. Okay? So therefore, air pressure in the container increase. Okay. So because it will, uh, it will collide with the wall container frequently. Okay. Since the temperature is higher and the velocity of the uh, the velocity of the molecule also will become higher, so it will collect more with the wall container. So means there will be more force will be produced, and you know already the force is actually the air pressure. So the air pressure will increase. Okay, so what you have to remember is the lower the volume, the higher the pressure. Okay, and then the higher the temperature the higher the pressure, okay? So that is the two conclusion that we can get from this factor, right? All right, let's move to another question, right, number 16. Okay, diagram eight shows a box being pulled up on the inclined plane. So which of the following shows the direction of frictional force? Okay, so the frictional force is actually is always the opposite direction to the force that been given. So let's say if I drag, okay, if I drag the force, okay, like this, in this direction, so the frictional force will always in the opposite direction. So maybe we go down like this. Okay, so the answer is B. Okay, you always oppose the position of the force. Okay. So the frictional force is the force that resists movement between two surfaces that are in contact with each other. So this one you can see the the boy here, okay, push the that uh, push the box in the left direction. So the frictional force should uh, should be in the right direction, okay. Okay, for next one, okay. So this is the population. Mm. Okay. Mm. Oops. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So this is the calculation question, right? So this is the formula, okay? So the question said, a student who weighs 45 kg carrying a load of 5 kg runs up a staircase which is 8 meters high in 10 seconds. So how much power does he use? So this is the formula for power, right? Work divide by time, okay? And then, because the question didn't give you work, right? So it means you have to find the work first. So work is actually force multiplied by displacement, okay? So force, right? Force, you have to know the unit must be in Newton. Okay, but you can see here, there is no unit in Newton here. Okay, be given to you. But you have to know, you have, can change the kg to Newton. So how you want to change the kg to Newton, just multiply by 10. Okay. So 45 plus 5 because it's run and carry a load, a load 5 kg. So you have to add 45 and 5. So you got 50 kg. Okay. So 50 kg, if you want to change to Newton, you multiply by 10. Okay. So because F is equals to M. A, right? Okay. And then A is actually the acceleration. So here we take the gravitational acceleration as the A here. So M is 50. Okay. A is 10. Okay. So you got 500. Okay. Right. So we try to substitute here. So force is 500. Okay. And then displacement is actually the distance here. Okay. So the distance here is 8 meter, right? 
Okay, and then the next one is the time here. So the time is 10 second. Okay, so you use your calculator, 500 times 8, you've got 4,000. And 4,000 divided by 10, you've got 400. Okay, and the unit for power is what? Okay, so you got 400. <coughs> so the answer should be C. Okay. So we move, we move on to the next uh, question. Okay. So, all right. Diagram 9 shows four tables with different stability. Okay, the height of a what W is same as the height of the X. So W and X is the same height. And the height of the Y is the same as the height of the Z. So Y is same as Z. So which of the following statement is correct? Okay. So A, W and X have the same stability. No, because this one, the surface area is different, right? So it does not have the same stability. <coughs> Alright, Y and Z have the same base area. No, you can see this one is bigger than this one. Y is bigger than Z. Okay, Y is more stable than W. Okay, Y is more stable than W because Y is, has a higher center of gravity. Okay, so if the center gravity, you want to, uh, the stability is actually depends on the uh, center of the gravity. So the more, uh, the lower the center of the gravity, the higher the stability. So actually W is more stable than uh, Y. Okay, and then the next one is the W is more stable than Z because the base area of W is wider. Okay, this one is also correct. Okay. Is wider and also the center gravity center of the gravity is lower compared to Z here. So W is more stable. Okay. All right, so we do a little revision. So okay, factors that affect stability. So I already told you the first one is the position of the center of the gravity. Okay. So the lower the center of gravity, it gives more stability. Okay, and then the next one, the size of the base area. Okay, object with a large base area, we have a more support and also is more stable. Okay, and then the next one is the weight. So the heavier the weight, the the more stability of the and of the object. Okay, so the higher the weight, the higher the stability. Okay, for the position, the lower the position of the center gravity, the higher the stability for the size of base area the higher the size of base area the higher the stability okay so this is the factors that affect stability <coughs> all right the next one okay which of the following substance is important of transporting oxygen okay so the first one uh, the answer should be b hemoglobin okay so this one the hemoglobin Okay, uh, the trans is uh, in the red blood cell, right? So they will uh, combine with the oxygen to produce oxy hemoglobin. Okay, so we do a little revision. Okay, so this is the movement and exchange of the oxygen and carbon dioxide in the body. Okay, so the blood, the blood with lower co with lower oxygen and high concentration of carbon dioxide will enter the bloodstream here. Okay, the blood uh, bloodstream here. <clears throat> okay, and then this is the alveolus, right? So this is the alveolus. So you know, this is the place where the gas, uh, gas exchange occur. Okay, <coughs> okay, gas or uh, exchange occurs. So the carbon dioxide will go into the alveolus. Okay, and then the oxygen will from the alveolus we go to the blood. Okay. And then when the oxygen, okay, the oxygen combined with the red blood cell here. So inside the red blood cell, they got the hemoglobin. Okay, so the oxygen we combine with the hemoglobin to produce the oxy hemoglobin. Okay, then after that, it will be transport to the uh, whole of the body. Okay. <coughs> okay, hmm. so this is the... Uh, where the gas exchange occur in the body. All right, the next one is the process. Okay, so the first, the air inhaled into the alveolus, it has a high concentration of oxygen. Okay, compare the concentration of the oxygen in the blood. 
So therefore, the oxygen will diffuse through the wall of the alveolus into the wall of the blood of capillaries and into the blood. Okay. And then in the red blood cell, so there is a dark red color compound is called as the hemoglobin. Okay. So the hemoglobin, we combine with oxygen to form the oxyhemoglobin. Okay. <coughs> so this is the uh, equation. So the oxyhemoglobin is actually the unstable compound. Okay, why is it unstable? So it's easy for the oxyhemoglobin to release the oxygen. Okay, so that's why it's unstable. Okay, if it's stable means it cannot uh, release the oxygen so easy, right? So they have to be unstable. So when unstable, they're easy to release the oxygen to the uh, cell. Okay, and then compound and bright, uh, the color is a bright red in color. Okay. Okay, and then next one, the blood via OC hemoglobin is transported from the lungs, okay, to the heart and pumped to the other parts of the body, okay. And then when the blood reaches the area around the body cell that has a low concentration, okay, so there is after that, after it combined, after the oxygen combined with hemoglobin, it produces the OC hemoglobin. So the OC hemoglobin is transported to the lung, okay. To the lung, uh, from the lung to the heart, okay, and that is with pump, okay, it will be pumped by the heart to the other parts of the body, okay, and then uh, when, it, when the blood reach, okay, uh, in the area of the body that lack of the oxygen, okay, it will release the oxygen, so to become, uh, it will release the oxygen to become hemoglobin again, okay, <coughs> so the first one, when it Goes when you inhale the oxygen. Okay, when inhale the oxygen, we go to the alveolus, right? So where the uh, where the gas exchange occur. Okay, so means the blood red blood cell that lack oxygen, right here, the lack oxygen, we get the oxygen from here, and it will release the carbon dioxide. Okay, and then it will goes to the uh to the heart, and the heart will pump the red blood cell to the whole body. So like this, okay, after it combines the hemoglobin with oxygen, it produces the oxyhemoglobin and then the oxyhemoglobin, okay, we, uh, from the lung, okay, it will pump, okay, pump by the heart to the whole of the body, okay, and then after the oxyhemoglobin reaches a certain part, okay, the lack of oxygen, it will release the oxygen, okay, so it will release the oxygen that it will become the Hemoglobin again. Okay, we become the hemoglobin again. Okay, and then another one another, in the body cell, the diffuse oxygen oxidized glucose more molecules and carbon dioxide water energy through the process of cellular in respiration. Okay, so and then <coughs> after that, okay, you know that we do a uh, human does the cellular respiration to get energy. Okay, so what will be released? The carbon dioxide. Okay, the carbon dioxide. Okay, so this carbon dioxide will be transported, okay, by the red blood cell, okay, to go back to the alveolus, okay, and then it will release the carbon dioxide to the alveolus and get oxygen from the alveolus and travel back to the other part of the body that needs the oxygen, okay. Uh, so that is how the cycle, okay. So the carbon dioxide released by the cell diffuses into the blood capillaries and is transported to the alveolus to be removed during isolation. Okay, and then go back to process number one. Okay, <coughs> so I hope you understand how does uh, the gas exchange occur. Okay, so the first we inhale the, uh, the oxygen. Okay, the oxygen goes to the alveolus and then at the alveolus there, there will be exchange of gas. Okay. The, uh, the blood cell that, that lack of the oxygen but they got more carbon dioxide, we release the carbon dioxide to the alveolus, okay? And then the oxygen that we inhale, okay, it will be given to the red blood cell and then it will combine by the, uh, it combine by the, with the hemoglobin inside the red blood cell to produce the oxy hemoglobin. Okay, now the blood cell is rich with oxygen. Okay, and then we go back, to, uh, it, will, it will travel to the uh, heart, okay, and then the heart will pump, okay, will pump the blood to other parts of body, okay, then the red blood will travel, 
okay, to your other part of the body that needs the oxygen, okay, then it will release the oxygen there. So it will release the oxygen there, okay, because the oxygen hemoglobin is not stable, so it will easy, okay, to release the oxygen. Okay, after that, it will take the carbon dioxide. So why does the carbon dioxide come from? Okay, when you do this, uh, when the human did the process of uh, cellular respiration, you know, we, we release the carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide will uh, combine with the red blood cell. So now the red blood cell has a high ca high carbon dioxide, right? So the, we travel back to the lung, okay? We travel back to the lung, okay? So at the alveolus, that is change the gas back, okay? So mean they release the carbon dioxide there and they get the oxygen back. Okay, and then the carbon dioxide will uh, go up from our system okay, by using the as a uh, process. Okay. So this is the process of uh, exchange the yeah? gas. Right, the last one for the objective part. So what is the name of the yellow surface of the sun that, that can be seen from the earth? So the answer is C, photosphere. Uh, photosphere. Okay. So we do a little revision. So this is the sun structure. <coughs> okay. So the first one. <coughs> okay. The here is the. the <coughs> uh, okay. So this is a convection zone. Okay. So this is a convection zone. So this one is carry energy to just beneath the sun surface. Okay. The chromosphere is the white one here. Okay. It's a thin layer of gas above the photosphere. Okay, so along with corona, it forms the sun atmosphere. And then this one is the photosphere. This one is that we see from the earth. Okay, so this is the visible surface of the sun. Okay, so the temperature is around 5,500 degrees Celsius. Okay, so this is the part that gives off light. Okay, so it takes 8 minutes to for the light to reach earth. Okay, and then this one, the first one is a, this one, the, like a yellowish one. Okay, this one is a corona. Okay, so the corona is a thick layer of the gas above the chromosphere. So it extends from million miles of around the sun. So the corona is the outermost layer of our local star. So along with the chromosphere, it's only visible during a total solar eclipse. Okay, when the sun's surface is completely hidden behind the moon. Okay, so the outer layers is the corona. Okay, corona, chromosphere, and then the inside here is chromosphere. Okay, sorry, photosphere. Okay, the, la the first one, the first layer is the corona. Second layer, chromosphere. Third layer is the photosphere, the one that we can see from Earth. And then the, it's like this is a core. Okay, and then it, the temperature is very high, like 15 million degrees Celsius. Okay. Okay, and then this one is the radiative zone. Okay, so this one, the energy from the core slowly rise in the radioactive zone. So it give, uh, takes the energy about 1 million years to travel out to the radiative zone. Okay, <coughs> and then this one is a convection zone. Okay, so this is the sun structure. Okay, next we move to the section B. <coughs> Okay, match the, uh, match the following hazardous symbol with the correct statements. So this is the poison, okay. So the example, the statement must be the example of mercury and chlorine. So this is actually the acid solution, okay. The symbol for acid. So acid is a corrosive chemicals, okay. So next slide is... Okay, we do a little vision. So this one is actually form one, right? You learn already. So this is irritant. So the chemical which irritate give up vapor or fumes, okay, that we hurt the eyes, nose and throat. So avoid inhaling the vapor or fumes. Okay, so use a chemical inside a fume chamber. So the example is chloroform and ammonia. Okay, and then this is symbol for radioactive. Okay, so it can cause cancer. So the example is uranium and plutonium. <laughs> okay, the next one is uh, those chemicals are corrosive, okay? So you cannot touch this chemical because it will burn your skin. So they say if you, you, you touch with your hands, so you have to wash it, okay? So uh, with a lot of water, 
Okay, so in case of contact with the skin, wash the affected parts with lots of water. So the example is a concentrated, uh, concentrated acid and alkali. Right, the next one is uh, poisons. Okay, so this is the chemical is poison or toxic. So you cannot drink, eat, smell or taste this chemical. So this one is a mercury. The example is a mercury and chlorine. And this is symbol of the explosive. So this chemical is explosive. Okay, so you can use but you have to follow the instruction. So this one the example is a hydrogen gas and a butane gas. Okay. And then this one is the flammable symbol. So this one is easy vaporize and it's a flammable. So this one you cannot keep uh, near the fire or heat source. Right. So the example is the alcohol and petrol. <coughs> Okay, so this is a symbol that you have to know, okay, if you use uh, any substance or any uh, chemical, okay. Alright, so the next one, okay, write true or false for the following statements, okay. So a level balance is used to measure the weight of the balance, so the answer is false, okay. And then another one is a critical thermometer is used to measure the temperature with accuracy of 0 0.1 degrees Celsius, so this one is true. So let's say the clinical thermometer, okay. So the clinical thermometer is a spe special liquid in glass thermometer used by the doctor and nurse. Okay, so it was the same way as the ordinary liquid in glass thermometer but some additional features. Okay, so you can see it's not starting from zero, okay. Why? Because the human body is actually around 35, 36, right? 36 until uh, 40 something. So we didn't start from zero. Okay, usually the term clinical thermometer we does not start with zero, okay, because the normal temperature for the human body is like thirty six to something, thirty six point five to forty something, right? Okay, so the clinic in the tube stop the temperature uh, temperature reading for failing when the term clin uh, clinical thermometer is removed from the patient. Okay, so this one I think you already learned about the thermal equilibrium, right? So let's say if you put the thermometer, okay, under your tongue, okay, and then the doctor will take like a few, okay, few, like one minute or something, okay, until the thermometer stop expanding, okay, then it will read. So actually when the thermometer put in your, in your, under your tongue, okay, the heat from your body, Okay, we go to the thermometer. Okay, and then the mercury inside the thermometer will expand. Okay, so it will expand until, okay, the thermometer, uh, the temperature of the thermometer is same as the temperature of your body. So that time we call it the, we call it as a thermal equilibrium. Okay, it already reached the thermal equilibrium. Means the temperature of the Thermometer is same as the temperature of the uh, patient's body. Okay, so I explain again the heat from the trans uh, the heat from the patient transfer to the thermometer. Okay, until okay, and then the mercury will expand. Okay, and then it will stop. Okay, after the temperature of the thermometer is same as the temperature of the patient's body. And that time we can say the thermometer reach thermal equilibrium. Okay, in both temperature is same. The human, uh, the body, patient's body, and also the thermometer. Okay, all right. And then the scale is shorter and more accurate. So I already told you why it's a uh, shorter. Okay, we don't start from zero. Okay, and then it's a triangle shape magnify the liquid. Okay, so it make it is easy to read. Okay, so this is the clinical thermometer. So it's different from the uh, from the one that we use in the lab. Okay, the lab is actually we start from zero, the scale. Okay, <clears throat> right, next one. So diagram one shows several examples of organism or cells in the human body. So circle the organs. So this is the uh, stomach and this is actually a pancreas. Okay, so this is the example of the organ. So this is just tissue. Okay, this is the system and this is the cell. Okay, so we did a little revision. So this is the 
uh, structure. Okay, so it's, the first one we call it a cell. So one is called a cell. So one group of cell we call it as a tissue. Okay, one group of tissue we call produce an organ. Okay, and then one uh, an organ. Okay, many organ produce a system. Okay, and then the system, many system will produce the organism. Okay. Alright, the next one. Alright, photosynthesis is process that is carried out by plants to make their own food. So, mark, okay, the products of the photosynthesis. So, of course, oxygen and glucose. Okay, carbon dioxide and water is usually released for the recipe ration. Right, the glucose plus oxygen produce energy, right, water and carbon dioxide. Okay, so this is the product for cell recipe ration. Okay, for photosynthesis, oxygen and glucose. <coughs> okay, next one. Diagram 2 shows a pair of pliers. Okay, so complete the boxes by using the words given. Okay, so this is called as a fulcrum. This is effort. Okay, this is where you uh, grip the pliers, right? So you give force here, okay? And then this is the load. Okay, so complete the statements below. Okay, so the first class level, the fulcrum is between if effort and load, okay? And then next one, a lever is a simple mesh, uh, machine that help us to do work more easily, okay? So we do a written revision about the lever. <coughs> so lever, we use a various type of tools at home in school every day. So those tools help us perform tasks easily based on the level principle. So what is the level is actually? So a lever is a bar that rotates on a fixed point. Okay. So it rotates the fixed point. So this, this is the fixed point. So it will rotate. Okay. It will move. Okay. This, this bar will move. Right, whether it's going up or going down. So a lever is made up of three parts as shown in the figure 8.16. Okay, so you have to know the thing you already know. Fulcrum, load, effort. Okay, so the effort is the force applied on the bar. Okay, and the load, okay, object to move. Okay, whether you want to lift it up. Okay, and fulcrum is the fixed spot, uh, support point. Okay. So, this is the part of the lever. Okay, so a lever is a lever. A lever is a simple machine. So, what is the purpose of a lever? Okay, so the purpose of the lever, a lever allows uh, allow us to do work easily. Okay, and then second one, it's use, allow us to use minimal force to do work. Means it's safe, uh, Okay, is uh so we don't need to use a uh, high force okay to do a work. So we use only minimal force. So this is the purpose of lever. Okay, so let's see the first one. Okay, so the level, the classification of level, they got the three types. Okay, the first one is a first class, second class, and third class. Okay, so depending on the position of the effort, fulcrum, and load. Okay. So, for me, I just like to remember the position of the fulcrum. Okay. So, let's say the fulcrum is between load and effort. We call it as a first class level. So, let's take uh, the pliers as the example here. So, you can see the fulcrum is in the middle. So, this is the fixed point. It doesn't move. Right. And the effort is the one, the force that we given is here. Okay. Whether you want to push it. Okay. Or you want to release it. So, this is where the effort being given. And this is the load. Okay. So, this is called as a first class level. Okay. So, same like scissors also. Okay. So, this is the fulcrum. This is the fixed point. So, this is the effort. Okay. So, you give the force. Right. And this is the load, the paper here. Okay. So, this is the example of the first class level. Okay, for the second class level, you can see the fulcrum is at the end here, okay, on your left, right? So, the load is between fulcrum and effort, and the load is in the middle, okay, and the load is in the middle. So, let's see, okay, 
We use the nut crackle as the example. Okay. So the fulcrum is here. Okay, and the load is in the middle, and this is the effort. Okay, so for the wheelbarrow, you can see this fulcrum is here, the tire here. Okay, this is the fixed point. Okay, and then the load you put here, and this, this is the effort. Okay, so this is the example of the second class level. Okay, the load is in the middle, the first class, the fulcrum is the middle. Okay, and then the third class level. Okay, the effort is in the middle. Okay, the effort is in the middle. So, example is the ice stones. Okay, so this is the fulcrum. Okay, and then the effort. Okay, this one where you push. Okay, uh, and where you push your grip, right? Right, and then this one is the load, the ice here. Okay, so this is the ice stone. Okay, for fishing rods, okay, the fulcrum is here. Okay, so this is the effort here. And also, the, this one is the load. Okay. So, you have to remember the example of the level. So, the first one, the fulcrum is the middle. The second class is the load is the middle. And the another one, the third class level is the effort is the middle. Okay. F-L-E. Okay. F-L-E. Okay. Fulcrum middle, load in the middle. And then another one is the effort in the middle. Okay, but you have to know lah where, which part is the fulcrum, which part you put the load. Okay. Alright. Next one. So this is actually the summarized, okay, for the level. Okay. And next one is the moment of force. Okay, so the moment of force is the force and object can rotate the object at a fixed point. Okay, pivot of fulcrum, the turning effect produced is called as the moment force. Okay, so example like here. Okay, so this is the, uh, you you want to open the, this is the spanner, right? So this is the moment of force, mean you rotate it. Okay, you rotation it. So this is the moment of force. Okay, and then this is the distance. Okay, distance between the force and the, yeah, okay. So, for this one, okay, let's see, you open the door. So, the moment of force is when the door moving, okay. So, this is the moment of force, okay. And this is a distance, okay. This is the distance, the fulcrum, okay. From the force to the fulcrum is called as a, this is the distance. Okay, so the next one, okay. So, the calculation. Okay, so let's say this is a spanner. Okay, and then when I rotate it clockwise. Okay, okay I rotate it clockwise. Okay, so the, the rotation is the force, right? So, the force I give is 50 Newton. Okay, 50 Newton. Okay, so, uh, I use a 50 Newton to rotate the spanner here. And the distance between my hand and the pivot here or the fulcrum here, okay, is 20 cm. Okay, we have, we have to change to meter. So, 20 divided by 100, you got 0 0.2. So, and then you just multiply. So, this is the formula, okay. Force multiplied by perpendicular distance of the pivot to the force. So, 50 times 0 0.2, you got 10, right. Okay, so for example 2, Okay, so let's say I use a force to open the lid of can. Okay, it's 10, uh, with 10 newton of force and then the spoon of length is 15 cm. So calculate the moment of force. So it's easy. I use a 10 newton, right? So 10 multiplied by 0 0.15. Why I change it to a meter? Okay, the distance between the uh, lid here, the length of the spoon here. Okay, it's 50 cm. So I multiply, I got one point. And then the moment of for, for, sorry the moment the mom the sorry moment of force will increase if the magnitude of forces increase by applying of greater force. Mean you they say I use ten then I change to twenty newton so means the magnitude of force increase right so the moment the moment of force also will be increased and another one the perpendic uh, perpendicular distance from fiber to effort increase. 
So let's say I increase the distance. So let's say I use a longer spoon here. So mean the distance will be increased. So the moment of force also will be increased. Okay. Alright. So let's see. Okay, the last one. Okay, before I stop. So observe figure 8.28. The weight of the load produces a clockwise movement. So the applied effort produces an anti-clockwise movement to balance the level horizontally. Therefore, the product of the magnitude of the effort and the perpendicular distance from the pivot group is the same as the moment required to balance the level. Okay. So let's say this is the... Uh, Okay, so let's say you put the load here. Okay, you put the load here. Okay, so what will happen? So this one will go up, right? Okay, and then you put the effort here also. Okay, so it will be balanced here. Okay, so means at this time, okay, the moment of force here is actually equal the, with the moment of force here. Okay, so that's why it's balanced. Because the moment of force is same. Okay, for this side, to, for the left side, is same as the moment of force to the right the to the right side. So that's why it's a horizontal. It means it's balanced. Okay, so let's see the example. So figure eight point two nine. Two children sitting on the seesaw. Okay, what is the distance of Jayin from the fulcrum? So the seesaw is balanced. So this is the formula. Okay. The moment of force in Jiayin side is the same as the moment of force at the for the Wei Hong. Okay, so the load times the distance of load from Fukrup. So from here to here. Okay, so two hundred newton. This is the force for Jiayin. Two hundred newton, and d is the distance between Jiayin and the Fukrup. So d. The one. This is the one that we need to find. Okay, it's same as Force of the Wei Hong multiplied by distance of the Wei uh, distance of Wei Hong to the fulcrum. So two. Okay, now you just solve it. You got d is equals to three. Okay. So how you don't uh so yeah I hope you understand why we say it. We use this for formula. Okay, because we assume that the moment of force is to the left is equals to the moment of Force to the right, so that's why it's the horizontal means it's balanced. Okay, both are same. Okay, so I stop until here first. So later, I think we continue with the other slide. Okay, so maybe on uh, Tuesday, also, I think I will go on with the online class. Okay, I will just ask 3G to join our class. Okay. Uh, so I hope I can see you on Tuesday. So Tuesday got online class. I think still at 10 a.m. if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so I guess I stop first until here. Okay. Alright, thank you class.